and welcome to Stop Now, a social experiment where we stop, listen, and learn. Welcome back, everyone. I am one of your hosts, Nate, and it is great to be back with you uh, for this edition of the talk show. We have a very special guest to introduce to all of you all this week. But before we get there, I have to introduce uh, my 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 partner in crime, if you will. And, and uh, he is the man in the mask. He is the, the voice of the voiceless. He is the wizard operating behind the curtain. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. It's just JK. JK, how are you, my friend? I'm good, Nate. Uh, you are giving an excellent introduction to me rather than I would uh, give that to the special credit to Cassandra Smith. Uh, and uh, let's go with that and uh, see like what Cassandra has to offer to our audience in our talk show today. Cassandra, yes. thank you so much and uh, welcome to our uh, talk show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time out to uh, join us this week, Cassandra. And before we kind of get deeper into, um, you know, our discussion this week, could you take a, a few minutes to introduce yourself to our audience, tell them a little bit about yourself and, and what you're passionate about? My name is Cassandra. I am sharing today from Orlando, Florida. I love the sunny, so I hope everyone can experience the warm sunny of Florida. I am an author and a speaker. I'm very passionate about mental health advocacy, mm. but also just really diving into your story and, and owning it and then positioning your life, positioning your life in the direction that you want it to go. That's led me to create Change Your Narrative, which mm. is a key processing tool to help individuals be able to look at their story and point it where they want to and take back the pen um, in case someone else has gotten hold of their story I advocate for them to take back that control mm. so how did how did this become a passion of yours Cassandra for like sure. how, how did you get started in this field I have always been very connected inside of faith communities. When I was young, I had my own struggles and there were leaders that helped me, that sat with me, that gave attention and mm. care and nurturing to my story. And that was something very influential in my teenage years that led me to want to replicate that in other places. And so then I began investing as I got older through my 20s and my 30s, began investing in that in the faith community. And especially with a lot of young people, high school students, college age, young adults. And what I discovered is they were not too dissimilar from me. We all have some sort of struggle that we're working with, something that's in our background that we may not want there whether that was abuse or addiction, self-harm tendencies, suicidal ideation, anxiety and depression. These things are rampant in America. And I wanted to create solutions. I've always been passionate about writing. So I began writing books, material, research guides, resource guides to help support individuals who were, were standing in and being a good friend or a good parent or a good community leader. I wanted to help resource them, but then also reach out to that individual who's struggling and say, I got you, I'll meet you screen to screen or page to page. And I, I just wanted to be there and offer that, that hand that says, I've been there, come with me. Like, let's go walk this path together. So when, when you talk about changing your narrative, um, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, there's, a, there's about a million different paths we can kind of go down and talk about <laughs> sure. this. Uh, but I did want to, you know, because you did mention talking to some younger folks, you know, and I'm sure. thinking in particular of people that I interact with on a day to day basis that are 20 and younger. Um, right. Is is it different for them in this era? You know, particularly talking about social media and sure. kind of how everyone's connected, but we're all isolated in a sense. Oh. Is Does that change the way somebody can control their narrative? Well, think about it. Social media offers a wide canvas for you to tell your story. Mm -hmm. It also offers you a variety of platforms in which you can define yourself. Are you, you know, the Instagram, you know, famous 
girl who looks mm. amazing, gets all the likes? Are you the TikTok clown who can make anyone laugh? Are mm. you, you know what I mean? Like, who are you presenting yourself on and on what platform and where are you garnering the most attention and the most support? You might think that attention is support, right? And so we build our stories off of where we get that affirmation. But is that really the story of our life or is that just the area that we're sharing mm -hmm. and that we feel comfortable talking about and that we get the most reward from? So do you have a hidden story and then do you have your social media story? And then mm -hmm. how do you reconcile between the two, especially if in your, you know, your hidden story, you're really struggling and you can't make everyone laugh every day and you don't laugh every day. Yeah. Or you don't feel beautiful every day, or you don't feel strong every day. Even if you're putting out memes left and right, like you can do it, but it's, there's a divide. And so, yes, I think for young people, I didn't have social media um, when I was a teenager. So I definitely see differences. And in the past two to three years, I see a lot of differences where we weren't meeting in person to live our stories together in a tribe, you know, mm. in our community we were living our entire lives screen to screen. And I think that that caused a disruption. Okay, let's, so let's stay, let's stay here for a second uh, then, sure. Cassandra, because and it, it almost feels weird to say that we're out of the pandemic because I think for it, it varies depending on where you are and depending on how sure. COVID has kind of hit your particular family or group. But now that we're kind of past the worst part, I guess we could say, how did that did that time period did that two years kind of affect people and, and change them from a mental health perspective sure i am not a clinician so i can't speak to that from a research standpoint what i've personally observed though is anxiety rates depression rates mm. i mean i've gone through the roof i can't tell you what the statistics are but i have read articles that say like especially in that i want to say like 13 to 25 year old category where maybe, you know, you've got to think about it. those are our developmental years where we're forming relationships. Yes. Like we're figuring out what we are independently and how we're building bonds relationally. And then you go into quarantine for how long? You don't go to school anymore. You, your workplace might've been shut down. You're now in remote work, remote school. Mm. In that specific time period of life where you should be building relationships and learning strategies, and there was more isolation. Yeah. I see that being a problem. Again, I'm not a clinician and I can't speak to it from that standpoint. But I know for me, I had a hard time. And I'm in my late 30s. Mm -hmm. But I didn't do well meeting with the world just from my laptop in my home by myself. So I can't imagine it being easy for those who are younger than me, who, you know, you, when you're, high school, college, young adults, you know, your, your friends are your life. Mm. And we didn't have a lot of meeting opportunities for a while to build those in-person friendships. So I see it being difficult. And I, my personal belief is that a lot of things surfaced because of those unique factors. Mm. Um, I can speak to that personally, maybe not for the country or society, but <laughs> I feel like I wasn't alone in that, but you know, the anxieties that I had only got stronger um, because I didn't have the same support. So I, yes, to answer your question, I do think that things were um, heightened and surfaced. And I don't know if there was a lot of support ready to handle that. Mm. It, it's interesting because I feel like we're in a similar age brackets. And so when you talk about anxiety and some of this stuff coming to the surface like there are and i'm particularly speaking about guys you know who sure. historically have not been the most open with with these kind of things like there's guys that i went to high school with the guys that i went to college with the guys that i work with over the past two years that'll just be like you know nate i'm, I'm kind of feeling a little anxious today and yeah. it's like you know this is something this guy would have never told me two or three years ago but yeah. it feels like everybody's a bit more vulnerable a bit more raw over the yeah. past two years and i don't know if that's because all of a sudden we just can't hide it anymore hide mm -hmm. it in our regular routines mm -hmm. that got so disrupted i'm not sure um my hope would be that there's so much more just awareness 
and I don't know if affirmation is the right word, but just support for mental mm-hmm. health. I think everyone was under tremendous strain. I think we were in tremendous strain in 2019. And then you put 2020 <laughs> on, the, on everything, right? We live fast lives. We're, we're running about a million miles a minute. We're in so many different directions. There's so many influences, so much influx, even just, uh, I, I study publishing and marketing, right? Mm-hmm. And even just from an advertisement standpoint, we receive so many messages every day that we have to filter through. Like we're just bombarded by information that I don't know if we always have time yes. to stop, listen and learn from our own stories. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's the world is noisy. <laughs> and then you throw a pandemic on it. I, I think maybe surfaces. that might've been the only or one of the few silver linings, I guess, is yeah. that I think that, because you're right, like a lot of these issues were around in 2019. If we want to be honest, a lot of these issues have always been around, you know, in terms of mental health and in terms of people are just overworked and overstressed. And, you know, and, and I feel like because we had a break or a pause for a year, year and a half, two years, it kind of allowed people to breathe maybe for the mm-hmm. first time in their adult lives. And it's like, okay, so I've been going to work anxious for the last 10 years of my life and not knowing what that feeling was, just knowing that that feeling was there. And now because I have this space, because I'm not in the office every day, I can kind of put a name to it. You know, like, oh, this is anxiety or, oh, this is depression or, oh, this is, you know, just stress. And so I, I feel like even though it was a bad situation for all of us, there, there were some good things to come out yeah. of it. I mean, I think that any time that you pause, there's an opportunity for clarity if you steward mm-hmm. that time well, um, if you have the ability to steward that time well. One of the things that I discuss in my books and in my online mentorship courses is the concept of scheduling silence. Mm-hmm. I'm a big advocate of actually putting in your calendar blocks of time where you're not responsible to communicate with others, but you can just reflect. I, I think it's fabulous. You mentioned in the intro to the show, stop, listen, and learn. I think that's a really great process for a wide variety of applications. But consider when you schedule silence, you're stopping, mm-hmm. you're listening to your own heart, to your own thoughts, mm-hmm. and you're learning from them. And that can be a scary process to step into, which is why I like to guide someone through how to schedule silence and then what you do at that time. But when we do give ourselves permission to learn from our own stories, to listen to our own hearts, mm-hmm. I think that there's value. I talked to someone a couple days ago and he was just like, you know, I, I just, I'm feeling all of these things. I haven't felt this in years. And I don't understand. And, you know, but I just, I feel like I just need to move on. I just need to do this, that, and the other. I said, or, or what if you just sat and listened to that for a while? What if you mm-hmm. gave yourself the time to explore it and not say that it was wrong to feel it? And I do think we had some time. <laughs> Our silence was scheduled for us in 2020. Yes, yes. And I think a lot of things surfaced. But then the question that I have is, what do we do with it? And I think you have to move that. It can either send you into a, a dark spiral Mm-hmm. or you can process your story in a healthy way. Sometimes that takes professional support. Sometimes that takes, you know, peer support, friends, good, good family members who can help with that. Mm. But you don't just stay in the silence. You have to move out of it mm. once you learn. And I think, you know, in terms of that transition, you know, I think that, that can be a difficult thing for people. And so, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, mentoring people and, you know, particularly talking with younger people, how, how do they make that first step? Like, what is the first step in terms of kind of taking control back of your story? I think it comes to identity. One, so first of all, I guess the first step before identity really would be believing that you have the power to take back the control. The analogy that I like to use is you take back the pen. I think that sometimes the pen to the story of our life, like that control seat gets mm-hmm. taken from us for young people. I mean, think about it. When we're young, when we're children, our parents influence our story, right? That's appropriate yeah. because they're guiding us. But in the teenage years, there's kind of this dance of am I in control or you are in control, right? Dance is like the nice way to put it. Mm-hmm. But, but there's that part of like, 
you write a page, your parents write a page. Like that's kind of a healthy progression. Mm. But then if there's an introduction of trauma or a mental health struggle or a crisis issue or a dysfunctional family unit, that gets really messy on how someone forms who they are. Mm. I think for women, I could be everyone, but I can only speak as a woman. Mm -hmm. I think we think that we have to give over control so that people think that we're nice and acceptable and mm. you know want to be in a relationship with us. I think it's very easy for women in dating relationships to give away the pen and say, well, you write me a good story because now we're together. Mm -hmm. no, 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 no. You need to believe that if that's not a healthy thing to be co-authoring because you're in a healthy relationship, then you can take back that pen. Like that's no matter who you are, yeah. you don't have to give away control to your life to be accepted, to be wanted. You can take control. So it's that mindset sh mindset shift mm -hmm. of I am my own author. I make key decisions that affect my life and I actually can make those decisions. That's step mm -hmm. number one. Step number two is then realizing that your identity is you. It's mm -hmm. not what happened to you. I, I work through this concept of victim is not your name tag. Do not let your brokenness become your name. Mm -hmm. Who you are, the value that you have, the worth that you have is inherent. It's intrinsic. It's in you. It's not because someone did something for you or took something away from you. You have value now. Your name is whole. Your name is precious your name is strong your name you know like who you are mm -hmm. does not come from any trauma and those two things usually start the path of being able to then process your story from a place of strength and wholeness instead of i'm so confused with how to dive into my life and process it well and i think and i, I can speak from experience here and i've talked about it a little bit on uh, the shows that we've done, you know, I was somebody that had uh, some childhood trauma, you know, and abuse mm -hmm. when I was 10. And it took until 30 Correct. to process that in part because I didn't acknowledge it right. for 15, 20 years. Right. And then once I did, it was very much like you're saying, like there had to come a point where I struggled with like, am I the trauma? Is that all right. that I am? Is all the choices that I made, is that because of this? And then, like you said, there, there had to be, come this moment of, no, like I am more than what happened to me. Correct. Correct. And it's hard mm. because especially if there were words spoken over you throughout the trauma where people mm. try to make identity statements about you, that's hard. Because mm -hmm. then you've got like emotional pain tied in with identity labels like people are trying to still it's hard and i think you know, like i said i had so many women in my life who were able to speak new identity labels over me mm. that it i was able to make a shift for me it's categorizing the authors in my life so there are untrustworthy authors who mm. don't get to take the pen Mm -hmm. there are trustworthy authors who get to help me know how I take back the pen and write a good story. But then there are also dark authors, those individuals that wedge in and say, well, I can write whatever I want. No, mm -hmm. no. And I think we're always going to be fighting to maintain boundaries so that untrustworthy and dark authors don't get in. And I think that we get scared saying, am I responsible because the dark author wedged their way in? No. No, mm -hmm. they were, they were thieves. They were liars. They were the villain. And they, they don't get to say who I am. You don't get to make an identity statement. Trustworthy authors can make identity statements, but yeah. not you fools. <laughs> and uh, so, okay, so now, Cassandra, I'm going to ask a question that, that might be controversial, <laughs> but I know JK uh, will never let me live it down if I don't ask it, because him and I, okay have always had this kind of back and forth discussion about religion, uh, you know, because okay. I'm a spiritual person and JK uh, is not, uh, but we still work together. We're still friends. But sure. what do you say to someone uh, when the trauma is caused by religion, caused by the church, caused by a faith group? How do you then approach healing or helping that person to heal? 
Do you know the organization to write love on her arms? Are you familiar yes, with that? Yes. I, I love their work. I support their work. I enjoy their message of outreach. I attended one of their events once mm-hmm. and they had these postcards that you could like say, like, this is my story. This is what I've worked through. Mm-hmm. And someone on there wrote, I was abused by a leader within the church. I've had crippling depression and anxiety. I don't want to kill myself, but this is my story. Mm. And I remember staring at that because I've, I've worked for churches. I've worked for nonprofits that are faith-based and looking at that was devastating going. I it, like, I can't claim ownership. Like I didn't do that to the person. I was not the perpetrator, but I'm affiliated with the same faith group. Right. And so it was this moment of shock that came from a source where I wasn't looking at a person, but I was looking at a person's story that I knew was in the same room with me somewhere. Mm. And what I did is I actually got a piece of paper, the same postcard and I hung it beside. And I said, I want you to know, I used to work for churches. I think what happened to you was incredibly wrong. And if no one within the faith community has told you this, I am sorry. Mm. I need you to know that it was wrong. That should have never happened to you. That is not the way. That is not what what I represent. Mm -hmm. And if I could, I wish I could have intervened for you. I can't speak to every single situation. And I cannot and I will not take responsibility for something that I had no action in. I will take responsibility for something that I did, but I'm not, I'm not going to claim that I can provide healing because I wasn't the party involved. But I will say that if there was abuse within the church, that's awful. Mm-hmm. Like I will acknowledge first and foremost, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And it is a terrible representation of something that's supposed to be beautiful. And supposed to be supportive and supposed to be for your story instead of stealing from it. Mm-hmm. The second thing is that I think ministry hurt, church hurt, abuse that happens within religious places is incredibly intimate. And it goes deeper because you're entwining faith beliefs and your soul with trauma. And that requires a special type of care. I went to screenwriting class and in filmmaking, there's this concept called the negation of the negation. And I I don't understand why they gave it that that (laughs) name, (laughs) but they basically said like, you know, the villain is bad when they're bad. Right. And they do Mm -hmm. these terrible things, but the negation of the negation is when someone who's supposed to protect you hurts you. Mm. It's like this tool used in storytelling to go like, that was a double bad that was like not okay mm-hmm. twice. And I think anything inside of a religious hurt is that double bad because it's supposed to be a place of nurture and love yeah. and grace. And for that to be the place of perpetration, that, that requires a special kind of care and such an advocate for getting that help. Mm. And it is hard to find. I think... For me personally, the place that you've been hurt might be the place that you have to be healed or else it feels like there's not that connection. Um, And so like, where do you find good help within the church that says that was wrong? Mm -hmm. Now let's get you the exact care that you need. But starting from that place of ownership of naming the wrong, the wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It, it does, because I feel like, uh, and I, I don't know if JK wanted to jump in here, uh, but I feel like there is, and you, you spoke to it, there is an, a, an extra level of betrayal is. because is. these are a lot of people that you have put literal and figurative faith in. And mm-hmm. to have that be the source of the trauma, it, it's something that a lot of people struggle with. It, it's tough. And it, I think that there are a lot of cliches that go around in this topic and I Mm -hmm. hate that because cliche does not help process the story of trauma like it just doesn't yeah it feels like a slap in the face you know people will say like oh you know 
you should be able to love God outside of people. People are people, you know, the church is you know, it's made up of broken people too. And I, I understand the truth behind some of those statements. There is a factor where I think God is separated from people. Mm-hmm. I also think there's this spot where you have to address each side. And I think it's taboo to say like, God, I'm mad. Like, I'm mm-hmm. actually very mad. And I feel like you let me down because your people hurt me. Where mm-hmm. were you? I, I've written several books and the title of them is Where Was God When? You know, where was God when I was struggling with suicidal ideation? Where is God mm-hmm. when I'm struggling because of the after effects of abuse? Those are big questions. Yeah. But I think that we need to give ourselves the permission to ask them in my life story, he's answered me and I've been able to work through it, but it takes an incredible amount of honestly, me being angry mm-hmm. and admitting that I'm angry and me saying things like, God, you let me down. Like you failed me. And there's theological ramifications of, you know, you, I ultimately know that God doesn't fail. That's my, my position of faith. But I need to be able to say, kind of like a kid who's just hurt and acting out, like, you're terrible parents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, they love you. You're just, you're hurt right now. You're speaking out of anger. Like, you're speaking because your leg's broken. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. But when a parent takes their kid to the emergency room and the kid has to get stitches, but there's pain involved in healing, the kid might say, you're terrible. You've done this to me. Mm-hmm. Not really. But you know what I mean? Like, there's... A lot of times in our our processing journeys, there is pain that comes back yeah. up. What do you do with that? And is that really God re-traumatizing you or is that him trying to heal you? Mm-hmm. It's a very careful journey. Um, I like to have these kind of discussions more in a one-on-one setting where I can actually lean into someone's story and find out what do you need? Like what kind of individual support and care do you need? Mm -hmm. I think everyone is hurt very uniquely. And I I try to be very careful for making blanket statements to a wide audience when everyone's story deserves to be really heard and nurtured one-on-one, especially if there's, like you said, this deeper level of hurt and betrayal that deserves to be met in a one-on-one setting. Mm. Uh, JK, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want you to feel like I've betrayed you, JK. Uh, so I'll allow you to ask a question for Cassandra if you have one, sir. Uh, yeah, Nate, you already did that. So <laughs> it was amazing uh, you both talking. Like, so I was uh, passionately listening to it mm-hmm. and grabbing all that uh, Cassandra was saying. So uh, Cassandra, the question comes to my mind like already he had written the narrative that like i'm a non-believer and uh, i'm an atheist and i uh, i come from the uh, opposite side and attack the believers uh, uh, keep that aside right my question is to you uh, uh, i am trying to portray the uh, a villain or maybe like uh, the trafficker and also be the voice of the victims sure. so my struggle is to understand like how uh, we have gone through a, a lot of stories with victims and they don't want to change the narrative. Yeah. So because of their trauma, right? So we can't yeah. understand. We can uh, superficially from the outside on the periphery, analyze that and sympathize with it and say like, as you mentioned in the uh, church example, right? Uh, acknowledging it and saying that uh, you have been wronged. It's not about right and wrong, right? It's not even mm-hmm. about mental health. The question is we are diluting the justice mm. that's how i look at it right because uh, traumatized victim even after they recover they recover in their own phase like they take it for years together yeah. uh, some of them even who survived uh, those uh, abuse they still recollect that and they live that and they keep saying the yeah. same narrative stories for their entire yeah. life right. so what do you have to say to that so the question is, what do you say to someone who is still facing the memory of the trauma for years after? Yes. First of all, that's valid. Like that, I do not think that like changing a narrative is something that 
happens within even a year. I mean, it, mm-hmm. I look at my story and the stories of some individuals that I've known for you know, two decades. And I think it's about a 10, five to 10 year process, depending mm. on the type of trauma. And I, I believe one of the, one of the things that the tools that I use within my own material is the difference between changing it and it being changed. I mm. think as an American, I'm like, I need it now. I need something to be done. I need it completed. Like I want to be changed. Like I did that. Here's my check off the box. Like I mm-hmm. changed my narrative, right? Mm. And I, I like to encourage people to go, no, no, no. There are certain topics where I'm still changing it. Mm-hmm. For me, I still wrestle with anxiety. I'm changing it, but it takes work. And there's mm-hmm. days that I can't change it, right? I don't know if I'm ever going to reach this place where I go, I never feel fear. Or is that my lifelong struggle of I have to use the tools that I've learned how to process my story to make sure that I don't spiral into a dark spot. But mm-hmm. there are times where I still spiral into a dark spot, but at least know how to bring myself back or my support team knows how to bring me back, right? Mm-hmm. So for these, for individuals who are saying, I have had hellacious abuse for how long? I don't even, like, that still is with me. That's valid. And it takes a mental, I think, I don't know if it's a mental decision, like a a purposeful decision is probably the word I'm looking for to say, I want to wrestle through and make a change in my life. Some people are not ready for that. Some people need more nurturing, more support before they're willing to dive in, or they just want to block that out. To that, I say, I I can't understand as if I've been there but I understand the desire to use that tool because you just have a lot of pain in your life. My concern, my concern always is that any unprocessed trauma will show up somewhere. It's Mm -hmm. going to show up in your decision-making. It will show up in your relationships. I'm not saying like your life is over. If you don't process (laughs) your story, that's, I'm not, I don't want to be fatalist with it, but I am an advocate for wrestling through the ugly, awful middle of processing your story so that trauma or painful circumstances or even painful memories are not in the control seat of your life and are not writing your story for you. I'm not saying it's easy. I think especially with trafficking survivors, that that process probably is longer and more um, detailed than my personal life experience or the experience of most of the individuals that I've worked with. So it's hard for me to speak to that exact circumstance in terms of knowing every single step along that way or the gravity of what they're facing. All I know to do is to rally for them, to champion for them and to say, I want to support you with tools Mm-hmm. if you are ready to get into that awful messy middle mm. absolutely yeah that, that's wonderful and uh, so, so i just want to touch upon right again uh, Nate, on uh, because i come from a different culture and as you try to distinguish between the god and the people right based on i'm not uh, i'm not judging on uh, the belief systems and perfectly that are uh, okay with so many belief system but in certain culture like you are the creation of god so you are by itself a god so whatever mistakes you make the god makes the mistake right why can't we uh, admit that and why do we uh, differentiate and distinguish saying that like there is some supernatural entity that protects you alone but whereas you have to own the responsibility how is it fair um so i'm not sure to exactly how to answer the question i know that in my faith system i don't actually believe that i am deity because i'm made in the image of god i believe that it's more like being a child of god that i can carry um his character qualities into the world. Like I, 
I can represent him, but I am, I do not claim a deity status. Um, he gets all of the deity <laughs> status. <laughs> um, but, uh, hold on, like that. sorry. Okay. I might be oh, a misunderstanding. No, every religion believes that like uh, we are uh, created by God, right? Is that right? So if God has created, what is the problem? So when the minute like the societies are, the laws are not created by God, it was created by humans. And we are struggling with this social structure and right. trauma and justice and all those things. So when you right. leave it to God, then you don't have to worry about anything, right? So he will take care of it. Oh, no, not for me, at least. I feel like I worry about a lot of things. So, so I, they're, they're, uh, that, they're, that is where like my argument comes with Nate as well, because everybody there, there is a doubt. So you are still a percentage like non-believer. The question that you might be asking is where is the justice? Like, does God just take care of justice in the end or is there justice here in the earth? Is that the question? You, you can put it that way, yes. Okay. Um. Yeah, I think that the world is incredibly broken. I think that God, in, in my faith belief, God created the world. God gave man free will and to choose to either do the right thing or the wrong thing. And man chose the selfish thing to do the wrong thing. And I think every single day, every single one of us has that choice of are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing? And a lot of times we do the wrong thing. Mm. And we inflict pain on others. And my goal in life is to take ownership when I do inflict pain of others because I want to do the right thing. And I want to reflect a God who believes in justice and order. But I, I fail all the time because I'm human and I'm filled with terrible ideas. <laughs> like I, I can't, I can I have no goodness in and of myself. And I know that that means that I've hurt others. Sometimes because I know that I do, sometimes I don't know that I do. And I look for opportunities to make it right. So there is that justice because that's who I want to be. The problem is we live in a world that does have you know, traffickers and victims or traffickers and villains and people who make wrong choices because they want to profit off of it personally. Mm -hmm. And that is a very hard thing to wrestle with. I don't even know how to enter into that mindset because it's not who I am. But there's, we live in a world that has free will where people can do that and they do hurt others. And there are a lot of victims left in their wake. My faith system, I believe that God is seeking to redeem and restore all things that are broken, but that it does not happen fast in the same way that we don't process our stories quickly. Mm -hmm. That justice is a slow justice and it does not look fair a lot of the time. I believe that there is justice in the end, mm -hmm. um, that God will redeem and restore and make all things right, and that that pain only if you will be a uh, Christian. Yeah, Christian. One, exactly, right? So every religion says that only if you believe in my God, he will redeem. How is that convenient? How convenient mm -hmm. it is for... No, I mean, if you believe in Jesus, then you will be redeemed, or else like you are going to hell. The same way the Muslims and they say, like, if you believe in Allah, then you will be redeemed. So I don't believe in anything. So you mean to say, like, I'm going to hell? I can't make that statement. <laughs> I'm not going to make that statement. <laughs> no, um, I'm I, just kidding. Like, I, I'm, I, I try to have fun with religious people. And that's my... Sure. No, the, the logic here is for me, how do I change this narrative, right? because you have been brought up as a Christian, Nate has been, and uh, we have a uh, guest like Muhammad and other religious people, they are stoned to that narrative that this is the truth. Sure. My struggle is like, I... how do I change this narrative? The world, we all know by wars have been waged based on the religious belief and millions of people are being killed. Why are we struggling not to change that narrative? I focus on changing personal life narratives. So I can't speak to like large <laughs> society narratives and I'm not sure what we're talking about. But if we're talking about a personal one, you're asking me the question of if I have no religious background, can I still 
process my story and find wholeness? I believe the answer is yes. I was able to accomplish that through the help of a faith community and my belief in Jesus. However, I know that there are people who do not. And for those who do not have a faith background or a faith affiliation, I'm not going to sit here and say, you, you can't change your narrative. You're not worthy. That's not that I will never say that. Mm. Instead, I would say to someone who says, I, I want no affiliation with any form of faith. I still believe in you. I still believe your life has worth. I still believe that your story deserves dignity. I still believe that if you take the time to process your story and be able to say, these things that happened to me were not right. I was treated poorly. That And to still go through the mental, emotional processing, you can find a better story. Mm. Um, I advocate for redeeming, like I don't know if redemption is the right word because I know that it has faith affiliations, but I still believe in pursuing a whole life that does not let trauma be in the control seat of your life and be making decisions for you, but to say, I'm going to consciously choose a health and well-being for myself. Mm. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, wonderful. Again, uh, I don't want like to trouble you with my hard questions so i just want to bring in your fond memories of your uh, talk the power sure. of human to human connection uh, and if, with your permission i can play this out to our audience and sure. what uh, brought you to this platform and how did you feel what was your passion about this and maybe like uh, you you can talk about the uh, your is this like kind of a business model where you are trying to uh, um, give the helpful tools to the yeah. people who need like on an individual basis? Like I, I love that. Like when you said, like we cannot change the whole society or, or community, right? But right. The individuals. So how could you- I am, I am a champion for individual stories. As I mentioned earlier with Nate, like I think so many of these conversations are best had in one-to-one situations mm. where we're in the same room and able to really discuss vulnerably and someone can feel that individual attention and support um, in order I can't sit with everyone I would like to and just meet the world and chat with them and talk about their stories so in order to duplicate myself I created change your narrative um, somewhat as a business model I do offer products but the, I've written about 80 books and release mm. 10 online courses. And those online courses is really an online mentorship where I, I get to share, here's where I've been, here's what's going on. Here's this concept like schedule silence or victim is not your name tag or what is truth or choosing mm. hope. I wanna sit with you in it and walk you through that concept and then help you to process with these questions. Now, how do you feel? Now think about this. Like it's a very um, informal, it's not a counseling session. I'm not a clinician, but it is a processing guide. So someone feels supported and has that connection with someone who's been there, who's been through things, maybe not the same thing. Mm -hmm. I just, I really want to guide and support. So Change Your Narrative, the website that you mentioned, is my tool to be able to sit with people in their stories and help them with resources. Additionally, on that site, there is access to about 250 resource guides whether you're struggling with abuse, depression, mm -hmm. eating disorders, suicidal ideation, I want the person who is struggling and the wraparound care, the parent, the family, the friend, the spouse, the fiance, who's going, I know someone is struggling, but I don't know how to help them. Mm -hmm. I have support tools for them so that they can at least know who to call, what websites to look at, what books to read, what you know, TED Talks to listen to. Because I think, Ultimately, the question is, what do I do? And I wanted to answer the what do I do question, mm -hmm. not as if I had all the answers, but to point to resources and tools that were seeking to answer that question professionally. Mm. And then the, the TED Talk for me was just a life dream. <laughs> My goal is to step into the speaking world. And I love being in small groups or stadiums, either way, and just being able to share part of my message and offer these tools and offer action steps instead of just an inspirational call. Mm -hmm. The uh, TED Talk was my 
way of sharing my story when I did collect thousands of letters where I heard from people who were struggling saying, I've, I've gone through a lot and I need help. I collected those stories faithfully for a year when I lived on the road as a road manager to a conference. And I've always been frustrated that we as the conference didn't address those letters. So my TED talk is my, my frustration turned inspiration turned mm -hmm. call to action to be there for others when they reveal their story to you and you may not know what to do, but to offer three steps of please go um, support those who are sharing their story with you and steward it well, care for it. Mm -hmm. Here's how. Wow, that's amazing. Huh? Excellent. Uh, thank you, Cassandra. For sure. Nate, she's all yours. You can. <laughs> Yes, I uh, feel like, feel like uh, the prosecution rests. Uh, <laughs> no, it's great. It's great conversation. Uh, yes, These are yes. real questions. Yes, and, and that's, that's what I love about kind of the dynamic we have here on the show is that we can, you know, talk about different topics from different points of view. I think one question that, that did spring to mind when you were talking about the process of it all mm -hmm. is you might you might and you probably will i guess now that i'm forming it in my mind be a different person when the journey it when the journey that it will it never ends but when right. that leg of the journey ends versus when it starts because and i'm thinking specifically of myself where for like the first two or three years after you know i kind of went through uh my trauma and everything and then kind of processing it after that second or third year there were things that I had to deal with at 34 that I never thought about in terms of anxiety in terms of like depression in terms of like all of this stuff that was probably there but it was wrapped up in the trauma and now mm -hmm. that the trauma is gone it's like okay but here are these other issues that have been here and now as a, as, a, as a grown adult, you now have to deal with anxiety and depression and stuff that you didn't have to deal with for the last 20 something years. Right. Yep. So, so <laughs> like, because I know it's, it's one step, you know, in, in terms of that initial step that you talked about earlier and, and grabbing that pin back. But do you often find yourself having to speak to folks again at different stages of the process where they're like okay like we did this but now i'm dealing with this issue because we've dug up all of this stuff oh yeah i mean i think that there's always these like little creeping influences like mm -hmm. trying to display our story one way or the other like that's always going to be there um and i do think especially if there's significant trauma like you said, other things can kind of hide underneath. Mm -hmm. um, life is hard. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that to be cliche. Mm -hmm. I say, I mean, there's one thing when you're facing like a childhood trauma and you're unpacking that, but then what happens when you have a workplace bully? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What happens when you have a family member who comes back into the picture who's difficult, but you're 47 years old? Like there, mm -hmm. there's always going to be influences where you're not supported and someone else wants to take over part of your life for their own reasons and so I do think that it's a bit of a cyclic process I can speak to it from a personal standpoint like I said I'm in my late 30s and I was amazed how the past two years has brought up more anxiety in my life and I've kind of like you mentioned all of a sudden I'm like, oh, where did that come from? <laughs> what is that, right? Yeah. And there's days where I'm like, I almost feel that sense of failure. Like, oh, then did all of this work that I've done to reclaim mm -hmm. my story not matter? And I can feel that wash over me, but I kind of go, no, no. <laughs> like, I at least now have the tools and I can have a shorter mm -hmm processing time because I know how to handle this new obstacle because I've learned how to put these beliefs into mm. how I operate my life where I go no, no 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 like 
victim is not my name tag. And I know you're trying to place an identity label on me right now. You've got like the Sharpie marker and the mm. little sticker. And you're like, you want me to say who you are? And I go, mm, no, like I can recognize it quicker yes. and work through the new obstacles because I think I have a framework that I'm operating inside of. That's mm. me. I don't know if that answers mm-hmm. your question. It, it does because you're right. Like you're not, it might be a new obstacle, but you're not starting from scratch. Correct. Because you've done Correct. some work already. Correct. I think triggers are a very fascinating mm. concept because we can, it, it's weird how that stuff mm-hmm. will come up. And I do think when you're not hiding from your trauma, but you've, you, you've processed it and you've kind of said you don't own me, I do think triggers can come easier. This is just personal again. I'm not a clinician. But I think triggers can kind of now pop up in weird ways because mm-hmm. you just you're not in living in denial where nothing has access anymore right right and so there's like little awful like hello <laughs> <laughs> bring up we're like where did you come from yes. I, mean, I haven't thought about that in 24 years mm. excellent i feel like garbage now <laughs> like, <laughs> i'm taking the day off you know what i mean like you just it's going to happen but yes Ultimately, and I, I don't, again, I don't say it to be cliche. I do think that self-care is important. When, when I feel those triggers, one of the first questions I ask myself is, how do I get to a safe place? And what do I need right now? Mm-hmm. How do I get to a safe place is not like I'm running from someone who's chasing me. It's, do I need to be in my car right now where I can like just think because being in the workplace mm-hmm. is not right. Do I need to get out of this grocery store because it is just too much stimulus and like, mm-hmm. this is just not the right place for me to be. Um, Cause this is a hard moment. And I feel like I'm, you know, 13, like this is just, mm-hmm. this is weird and bizarre. And I don't know what to do. Am I safe? Am I in a safe place? And what do I need right now? Do I need to call a friend? Do I need to cry? Do I need to give myself permission to cry? Do I need to journal? Do I need to go for a long walk? Do I need to go play with my dog? Like, what do I need? Mm-hmm. That this moment is not overwhelming. Do I need to call my therapist? Like, what do I need? So it doesn't own me. Because, listen, we've been in some dark places in life, right? Like, that's real. And I don't think we should run from it. I think we should acknowledge it as much Mm. as we can. We don't let it own us. We say, you know what? That was awful. Mm -hmm. And this moment that I'm remembering right now is legitimate and it's awful. So I'm going to give it space and I'm going to run, I'm going to work through it instead of run away from it so that this doesn't take me out for the next three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think managing once, once, yeah. you, once you kind of identify something, you get better at managing the, right. like it's, it's not to say that trauma or triggers or these things right. don't pop up, but you, you you become better at handling them. Which... Correct. And you've got to give yourself that mm, mm-hmm. for, for me for a while, it was like, oh, no, 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 like, I'm done. Like, I don't feel that anymore. And I, I was, I was afraid that it undid mm-hmm. all this hard work. Mm-hmm. No, 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 you're, it's going to pop up. Expect it. Mm. Yeah, so we, one quick question. Yes, JK. So you talked a lot about, I think uh, we would love to have a part two and also talk more. And uh, for Nate is a radio jockey and he is from the... <laughs> A broadcasting background you can talk for us uh, but then uh, to keep it uh, interesting for our audience like i'm trying to wrap things up uh, sure. so you are so wonderful again my question is what is your trigger point right so which made you to uh, go on this journey because you are not a victim you are not experienced trauma and you said that right always like victim is not your name tag right so, my double question to you on that, like those who are victim, right? Do they have to uh, accept that shame? And how long do they have to carry that victim tag? And if they have to uh, get rid of that, like how do they do that? I know it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's go with your trigger point. Right? What was your uh, trigger point in life to go? Sure. I... I'm not trying to shut down the question. I am just going to say, I think that discussing triggers can be re-triggering. 
And I think that I would actually like to protect myself by not sharing, um, you know, the exact oh, things silence. that have triggered. Yes. Is, is exactly. that okay? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I just think it's a very personal thing and I don't want to, I don't want to undo some of the work that I've done mm -hmm. and I, I want to protect myself. Um, I, I, I think, what was the other side of the question though? No, the name tag. Uh, the if, name tag, if oh. Carry the oh. name tag because it's a crucial thing, right? Because right. Uh, people who are victim, because of shame, they don't accept that they are victim. They are hiding right. it and they are not bringing up the story at all. Right. You have to be in a place that you're ready to. I don't think that anyone else could have told me like, hey, you've got to change your identity now. I think mm -hmm. that I had to look at myself and go, I'm sad a lot. I'm frustrated a lot. I believe a lot of bad things about myself. Like I'm frustrated and I want a different life. I think I had to come to that myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think no matter the form of trauma or crisis or obstacle in someone's life, they have to want a new name tag um, or else I do think you hold on to it because it's all you know. Um, and so my hope would be that every single one of us has the opportunity to have good voices, trustworthy authors in our life who mm -hmm. speak of a better name tag who speak of a possible identity not that they're saying you have to become this to please me that's not what i'm talking about but who speaks that life that hope that encouragement and hopefully um, that offers a little bit of light and the opportunity of possibility to become whole because i think everyone deserves to live a whole life where pain is not the thing that's defining them mm. Yeah, and and I I do think it's it's also important the the people you let the uh, the people you let in your circle you know the 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 co-authors or the somebody that writes who writes your foreword I'm I'm going right. deep into the analogy now right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but we definitely appreciate you for spending some time with us this week Cassandra um, before we wrap up um, any last words and and also uh, you know promote the website the books everything sure. uh, for the folks out there. I just, I, you know, anyone who's listening, I want you to know, like, your story deserves to be honored, whatever it is. Um, you have value, you have worth. I recognize and acknowledge that there were probably significant challenges and obstacles in your life that might have come with pain. And my hope for you is that that pain is not what's defining you because I believe you are worth living a whole life. So just encouragement to everyone out there. Mm. I would love to connect with anyone. My website is changeyournarrative.org. On there, there's opportunities to either view the books, get free resources, or um, come with me on the journey through the online mentorship course. I would love to support you and walk with you in that platform as well. There's also a way to contact me if you want to send an email. Awesome, awesome. And we will post all those notes in the cool. in the show notes for everybody out there. Again, Cassandra Smith, thank you for spending yeah. some time with us this week. Uh, JK, we, we we did it. We did another one. We, we came through it together. And uh, any, any last words uh, for you since you are the co-author of, of this talk show? <laughs> Uh, Cassandra, thank you so much. That was really amazing. I really enjoyed and I sincerely apologize. <laughs> like if I uh, put in some hard questions to you it's or good. trying to trigger you to get some memories. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. I feel good. I feel whole. I'm not, I'm doing good. I appreciate your bill, you letting me have that boundary. So this is great. Yeah, th thank you so much again. It's wonderful to meet you and hope to see you. Uh, later in our shows. Thank Thanks you. All right. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, for JK, I'm Nate. Bye for now. For now.